War started at nine o'clock promptly. The people of Helsinki stood in the streets and listened to the painful rising and falling and always louder wail of the sirens. For the first time in history, they heard the sounds of bombs falling on their city. This is the modern way of declaring war. The plan of the Soviet invasion was for an overwhelming onslaught everywhere at once. President Franklin Roosevelt condemned the attack. It has invaded a neighbor so infinitesimally small that it could do no conceivable possible harm to the Soviet Union. A small nation that seeks only to live at peace as a democracy and a liberal forward-looking democracy at that. The League of Nations expelled the Soviet Union. But as bombs fell on Finland and the odds looked overwhelming, the world offered no practical help. There were a few exceptions, however, including Jack Hasey from Massachusetts, who had been living it up in Paris. I was 22. We're all young enough to want to do something. Jack and four other American expatriates formed the Iroquois Ambulance Corps and made the fateful decision to set off for Finland. The Soviets, meanwhile, were closing the circle on events that had begun in 1917, when the revolution swept aside Russia's imperial dynasty. That same year, after 600 years of Swedish domination and 100 years of Russian rule, Finland had declared its independence and established a parliamentary democracy. In 1918, Soviet-backed Finnish communists had attempted to overthrow that government. They were defeated in a bloody civil war that elevated a Finnish aristocrat, Baron Karl Gustav Mannerheim, to the head of the armed forces. A former general in Russia's Imperial Army, Mannerheim, with support from Germany, crushed the communists. Mannerheim was a character out of another age. He was tall, he had eyes like gray ice, he looked every inch the field marshal, but there was something almost 18th century about him. Having served in the Tsarist army before the collapse of the Russian Empire, uh, he also knew the Russian psyche. He was born of the Swedish-Finnish aristocracy. In fact, he did not learn how to speak or read Finnish until he became the commander-in-chief of the Finnish army. And I have heard recordings of Mannerheim's Finnish and the best that can be said about it is that it's at least better than Winston Churchill's French, but not much. In the summer of 1939, as the threat of war grew, Mannerheim urged the nation to strengthen its defenses across the strategic Karelian Isthmus. And this certainly was one of the factors that saved Finland, because it gave Finland about Finland's army about four months to get organized, settled, uh, refresher training. Yeah, Silloin Kannakselle 10. päivänä lokakuuta niin kutsuun, kutsuttuun yh -hon. ja olimme siellä, minä olimme Kannaksella silloin junakuljetuksen aikana, olin junakuljetuksen päällikkönä ja Viipurin asemalla minulle toi karjalaisnainen, vanha mummo, toi minulle kukkasen Rintaan ja kiitti, että tulimme silloin kannakselle puolustamaan heitä, jossa ei ollut vielä yhtään mitään sillä kohdalla, missä me taistelimme. Ei, ei taisteluhautoja eikä mitään esteitä, vaan me rakensimme sinne kaivamalla taisteluhaudat ja, ja sitten esteet teimme korsut. For decades, Finland's leaders had refused to allocate funds for the nation's defense. Meillä oli 32 vanhaa Renoa, ei enää taistelukelpoista. Ja 32 pickersvaunua Englannista. Ilman tykkiä, ilman tähystyslaitteita, ilman radioita. Meillä oli yksi vaunu kunnossa. The Finnish Air Force was equally outdated and under strength. 
Mutta ne koneet olivat vanhoja englantilaisia ripon koneita, jotka oli, lensivät 160 kilometriä tunnissa. Ja venäläisillä oli 370 kilometriä tunnissa kulkevat hävittäjät. A widespread shortage of ammunition worsened the outlook for the outgun Finns. What do you do in a small country where there isn't very much ammunition? You use knives. And already in the Finnish history there has been puukko. And puukko was used for a lot of things. And now it became very handy as a defense mechanism. Because believe me, when you get that under your ribs, doesn't feel good. In an often unforgiving climate, Finns relied on the survival skills they learned as children. It was part of their character summed up in the word sisu. It means that personal kind of uh, ability or spirit that every Finns is supposed to have, that when things go wrong, you don't give up. In August 1939, the balance of power in Europe suddenly shifted when communist Russia and Nazi Germany, ideological enemies, became allies. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was the key that really made the war possible because it uh, gave Stalin a free hand in those parts of Europe that, that the treaty allowed him to move into. On the 1st of September, Germany invaded Poland from the west, unveiling a new form of warfare called Blitzkrieg. On the 17th of September, Soviet troops launched a similar attack from the east. The two armies met at the Bug River. In October, the Soviets demanded and gained concessions for military bases in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Finland's turn was coming. They could see that this was not just a war to change the borders a couple of kilometers. This was a total war where Stalin intended to occupy and uh, dominate Finland. The Finns refused to accept our conditions, so we were left with no choice but to decide the question by war. On the 28th of November, the Soviet Union broke off diplomatic relations. On the 30th, Soviet troops crossed Finland's borders. The entire Finnish army, a total of 300,000 soldiers, including reserves, faced the world's largest army of more than two million, with millions more in reserve. The first week of fighting demonstrated the power of Soviet armor as Finnish troops were pushed back. Shock and fear accompanied retreat and defeat. They searched for a way to beat back Soviet tanks. Our platoon leader informed us we were about to receive secret weapons that could blow up and burn any enemy tank. It did not take long until the promise was fulfilled. The Molotov cocktail is probably the most famous uh, poor man's weapon system of the 20th century, and it was named after Stalin's foreign minister, Molotov. If you got up behind the tank and dropped a bottle of flaming gasoline into those air ducts, the flaming gasoline would get sucked into the engine, the tank's fuel would blow up, and for the price of a half a gallon of gas, you could destroy an enemy tank. Toinen oli sitten nämä kasapanokset, ja siinä oli oltava vielä lähempänä, koska se ei ollut sitä pystynyt heittämään oikeastaan paljon 10-15 metriä pidemmän pitemmän matkaa, että, että se oli sitten se toinen hurja torjuntakeino. Ja kolmas, jota myöskin käytettiin, jolloin vieläkin hurjemmat miehet täytyy sitten olla on suorittamassa, pantiin halko. There was one uh, ski trooper who was decorated for actually immobilizing a Russian tank with a crowbar. He pried the treads off by brute force, whereupon his partner came out with a satchel charge and blew it up. I was full of fear 
and full of care because of Father who was in the war. <laughs> and then I felt that I had to be worried all the time because it was like giving strength to our men. We were called home front. Women had to do all those things what the men used to do when they were at home. So they had to work in the factories. At that time, our country had lots of small farms. If the husband was taken to the front, the woman there had to do all the work. And as also 50,000 horses were taken to the front, which just they couldn't work there without the horses. So from many houses, the horse was taken, so the woman had to work almost as a horse also. My grandmother and I were part of the women's auxiliary, which was called Lotta Sverd, which is based on a poem during one of the wars that Finns fought. And uh, Lotta Sverd was the name of the woman that took care of the soldiers. Lotta Sverd organized 100,000 women in defense of their homeland. The women knitted all kinds of woolen things to the soldiers, those what we call huppu, and where only eyes and the mouth possibly were seen. And then horrible gloves where there was a hole in the place of the first finger, and it was for the rifle. <laughs> Of course. When the women packed up boxes of food and clothing to send to their soldiers, Eva Kilpie added her own contribution. I wrote some poems. They, they, they were often like some prayers. Oh, God, re protect us, help us. And then I tried to rhyme them. I must have felt that there's something in the, in the art, that there's some, maybe I'm romanticizing this now, but I must have felt in the strength of words, even at that time, as a child of 11. Then there was something which has been done in no, no other country or war ever. Sometimes the soldier who has been shot or the bomb has killed him, you know how he looked, but the young Lottas washed them. First of all, in the winter war, they had to be melted because they were all frozen, you know. They melted them, they washed them, they put them in a nice, beautiful uh, clothes. And the, and the men then put them in a coffins because they were heavy. And then they were sent, all of them, each one, to their home areas. And the young Lotus did this. Crossing the Taipale River now takes about 10 minutes and costs 50 rubles per car. The ferry is a section of an old Red Army pontoon bridge powered by a recycled engine. In 1939, this river crossing was a killing zone. This is a place where the Soviet troops get across the Taipal and Yoki River and established a bridgehead. When the Soviet engineers established the Panton Bridge, the many casualties were because of Finnish fires. So this bank was full of Soviet engineers' bodies. Kirill Yakinovich is an engineer from St. Petersburg. He has crossed the river and walked this ground since childhood. He has looked beneath the surface and studied it carefully. Gradually, it's given up its awful secrets. I suppose that the Soviet 105th Rifle Division occupied these dugouts. There are plenty of them here. Dugouts, foxholes, which Soviet soldiers excavated. They attacked across this open field.
It began on the 6th of December. They were frontal assaults over and over and over again against the same heavily defended Finnish lines. Entire battalions were wiped out. By mid-December, three Russian divisions had failed to breach Finnish defenses at Taipali. The Russians went in principally for mass attack, which resulted in the attackers being mown down to the last man by a few well-placed automatic weapons. In spite of this, one attacking wave after another would follow with a similar result. In some cases, the second, third, fourth wave attacks were actually able to get closer to finish lines by taking cover behind their own dead. The temperature was so low that after an hour, a corpse would stop a bullet just as well as a brick wall. The carnage was too much for some defenders. There were instances where, uh, for instance, Finnish machine gunners became psychologically unstable because they were called upon to commit this, this, this absolutely mindless slaughter day after day after day. They may have hated the Russians for invading their country, but these were not uh, automatons. These were human beings with wives and children, and, and they were being called to murder hundreds of men a day. On the 17th of December, the Soviet offensive shifted to the most strategically important and most vulnerable sectors of the Mannerheim line, Suma and Lade. A breakthrough would open a gate to the city of Viborg. One flamethrower tank started to throw flames into the trench at Harkla strong point. Fire from millionaire bunker and from our infantry prevented the enemy's infantry from getting into our trenches. Two machine guns fired a total of 40,000 rounds. Our men held out bitterly in their trenches. There was no panic. Many silent dead littered the ground in front of our positions. Ja urhoolisia taistelijoita nämä olivat puna-armeja miehet. Ei siinä mitään, vaikka meidän tulitimme niin paljon kuin pystyimme suomalaisilla konekivereillä, pikakivereillä ja kivereillä, niin juoksivat siinä niin, että piikkilanka aidoille tulivat ja juoksivat sitten vielä toistensa yli, jotka kuolivat siihen. The tanks stopped took casualties and started to withdraw. This completely demoralized our infantry. The division did not have any success during the day of December 17, 1939, and after darkness, infantry was withdrawn, having suffered heavy losses. The battle was stressful, both physically and psychologically. In spite of a whole day of heavy fighting, we were not depressed. The fact that we held on gave us confidence. That confidence was tested each morning during the unrelenting Soviet offensive. The enemy's artillery barrage in the morning of December 19th grew to an overwhelming thunder and hit the main defensive line in Summa village the hardest. Our platoon leader gave me responsibility for dealing with the tanks approaching us on the highway. There were no signs of life inside the tank. With our small contribution to the fighting on this day, the hardest of the hardest days was over. But even harder days were to follow. Tanks again broke through. In the evening, we counterattacked. Despite all our shortages in equipment, we did the enemy a lot of harm. There were men in our platoon for whom the destruction of tanks was just a regular day's work. The 21st of December 1939 was Stalin's 60th birthday. 
His generals had promised Finland as a present. Instead, they sent back trainloads of dead and wounded and more bad news from the battlefront. I saw a field and our dead men lying like heaps of grass during harvest. The next day we did not attack. Our losses were too high and the assault was cancelled. The December offensive against Suma and Tepale had decimated seven Soviet infantry divisions. The remains of 250 tanks littered the battlefield. This was a stunning and unexpected victory for Finland. The winter of 1939 was one of the coldest in recorded history, with temperatures consistently below zero. Temperatures of minus 40 and 50 Celsius were not uncommon. We fought in our own country, in our own conditions. Every Finnish citizen was able to heat, able to work in the woods, in the difficult conditions, and also in the cold conditions. The Finns had snow camouflage. The Russians didn't. The Red Army troops stood out like proverbial sore thumbs. You couldn't miss them. As often as possible, the Finns tried to rotate their men so that the frontline troops at least got a few hours of warmth, a chance to have a hot meal. If you're gonna fight in that kind of an environment, you have to provide a diet that's extremely rich in protein and fats. The Finns were able to do that. The Russians were you know, black bread and tea. At 40 below zero, a hot meal is the difference between life and death. In mid-December, cold and hunger were the decisive factors in a battle Finns called the Sausage War. Marching through snow and ice, a Russian battalion slipped deep behind Finnish lines. All of a sudden, this Russian raiding force erupts in the rear area. This was the Russians' big chance. They had broken through, they were behind Finnish lines. If they had just kept going, they would have cracked the whole Finnish defense line. But what stopped them was the field kitchens. The Finnish cooks had just put on enough sausage soup to feed the entire 2,000 men in that sector. When they got a whiff of the sausage soup, it completely took the wind out of the raid. Ignoring their officers, the Russians immediately went for the field kitchens. We joudut tii siihen meidänkin komppana juurit keskelle sitä makkara kapina ja viime yö oli ja aina ammuttiin sinne missä vaan leimatti ja sinne päin ammuttiin ei näin pimeessä mitään tähdetä ja. And that's what gave the Finns time to regroup, counterattack, and virtually wipe them out. Markers in the village churchyard commemorate the defenders of the Battle of Suomasalmi. Memorials on the Rate Road honor another party, the elite Ukrainian 44th Division. When the 44th crossed into Finland, they brought a marching band and their dress uniforms for the victory parade at the end of their campaign. We can see all those stones, nearly 20,000 stones, and you can visualize that every stone is one man, and he had had a wife and children. Then you can imagine how much sorrow it has caused. The 44th Division crossed into Finland on the Rate Road in mid-December. They had been sent to relieve the beleaguered 163rd Division, pinned down on roads around Suomasalmi by meager yet persistent Finnish resistance. They were to then slice across Finland and cut the country in half. These were mechanized Soviet divisions, but the roads they were able to use, these were logging tracks. They were one lane wide, they were solid ice, and once the Russian columns were committed to that territory, they had to stay on the roads. The combined forces of the 163rd and 44th Divisions totaled almost 30,000 soldiers, 335 artillery pieces, more than 100 tanks, and 50 armored cars. 
their columns snake back 30 to 40 kilometers. They would attack and try and knock out vehicles on the road in the front and vehicles at the end so that the vehicles in between would then become stuck. The fins were on skis and they could move very swiftly for up and down the length of that column and they were completely invisible. The barrage of mortar fire, hand grenades, and the ski troopers would surge out of the forest and cut the road. And then disappear on the other side of the road. And after them would come combat engineers who would widen the breach and fortify it to cut off one segment of the Russian column from the other. They would isolate the units and cut them into what they called motis. And moti is a measure of wood in Finland. When you chop wood and you stack it up, that's one measure of wood. And that's what they did. They chopped up these divisions. Once these Soviet columns were chopped into motis, they were pinned down by snipers. The cold was so intense at Soma Somi that the instant a man was hit by a bullet and his circulation slowed, his body froze in the posture that he was standing in when he was hit. Men are exhausted and starved. We have about 400 wounded, no petrol. Most of the horses are killed. We are almost out of ammo. Enemy is attacking us from the front. Some commanders are deserting from the battlefield. I request urgent help. But there was no help for the 44th Division. Survivors huddled in underground dugouts against the intense cold, extreme hunger, and enemy fire. One by one, they were hunted down. 1,500 Soviet troops were taken prisoner. Captured tanks, trucks, guns, and ammunition helped replenish Finland's arsenal. Only 5,000 escaped across the border. Among them was General Vinogradov, commander of the 44th Division, and his two top officers. They were arrested, court-martialed, and placed before a firing squad. Suomasalmi is where the Finns scored their greatest triumph with Motti tactics. Motti tactics, repeated all along Finland's northern front, halted the Soviet offensives. Some Red Army units held out until the end of the war. None survived the Lemeti Motti. <laughs> Ja niillä oli niin nälkä, että ne oli syönyt kaikki ne hevosen luut. Pakkasella oli jyrsytty ja nahat. Oli kavio juuri ja myöti hampaa jäljet, mitkä oli pakkasella syöty, että oli pientäkin rasvaa saatu. Finnish victories made headlines around the world. 8,000 Swedes plus 800 Norwegians and Danes volunteered their services. Fundraisers were held in the United States, and supplies and equipment were donated. 350 Finnish-American volunteers sailed from New York. At the beginning of January, after a month of traveling, American Jack Hazy and his Iroquois Ambulance Corps finally arrived in Finland. They were immediately sent north, deep into the forests. He and his ambulance crew picked up the wounded and transported them to field hospitals, exposing themselves to constant danger from enemy attack and crossfire. One day, Jack's friend nailed a sign to a tree. When he brought wounded Russians to the hospital, he witnessed fierce emotions. Ruskies, Ruskies, Ruskies. They hated the Russians. He saw how Finnish ski commandos expressed themselves even more violently and described it in his memoirs. It has become a legend of the Winter War. A weird scene in still life. A Russian patrol standing by the side of the road, the men upright and frozen stiff in the snow, a Russian officer beside them, pistol in hand. All had had their throats cut. The officer's pistol was loaded. 
and not a shot had been fired. Jack's group became known as the Lost Yankee Battalion. An American reporter tracked them down and they appeared in a newsreel that was shown in cinemas across the United States. In January, sporadic fighting continued on all fronts. But after one full month of war, major operations by the Red Army ceased. January was largely a lull. Both sides were regrouping. It was a time of taking stock. The enemy's attacks in December could be compared with a badly conducted orchestra in which the instruments were played out of time. Division after division was thrown against our positions, but the cooperation between the different arms remained bad. In the 1930s, Stalin had conducted a campaign of terror against perceived enemies of the Soviet state. It had consumed the professional elite of the Red Army. Thousands of officers were arrested and executed, including 90% of its generals and 80% of its colonels. They were replaced with less experienced soldiers, along with a cadre of political officers. But real power was in the hands of the NKVD, a secret internal security force that reported directly to Stalin himself. <laughs> They interfered with everything, and they had the right and the authority to go in anywhere and to take very drastic measures like shooting the general, shooting anyone. Soviet state military archives document the fate of the 76th Tank Battalion, 34th Light Tank Brigade, trapped within a motti at Lemeti. In January 1940, battalion commander Captain Ryazanov began planning a breakout. But the battalion's NKVD officer opposed it, calling Ryazanov a coward. Ryazanov replied, I am in charge, I give the orders. Only 19 men from that battalion survived the war. For Stalin, the situation was desperate because he was worried about Hitler, even despite the treaty. He had to somehow knock the Finns out of the war. Stalin brings in General Timoshenko, who was one of the few really good professional Red Army soldiers who had escaped the purges. In preparation for a massive new offensive, Timoshenko augmented his forces with 45 divisions. They brought three quarters of a million soldiers, more than 3,000 artillery pieces, 2,000 tanks, and hundreds of fighters and bombers and he adjusted the strategy. Now he concentrated all the forces against the key to Finland, which was in southern Finland, the Karelian Isthmus. Field Marshal Mannerheim monitored the Soviet buildup and realized the inevitable was coming. Committing the last of his reserves, Mannerheim drew confidence from the fundamental strength of his nation. The nation stood as one man behind their armed forces in the calm and determined knowledge that the struggle must go on. On the 1st of February, 1940, the Russians resumed their offensive. Up to 2,000 artillery shells hit the Mannerheim line daily over the next 10 days. On the 11th of February, up to 250,000 shells rained down on the line the largest artillery barrage since the Battle of Verdun in the First World War. 8.35, an unprecedented artillery bombardment of our entire sector. 12.15, tanks have broken through. Enemy infantry has captured part of our positions. All Finnish reserves were thrown into battle, but the Red Army could not be contained. By the end of February 13th, on the third day of the offensive, the 123rd Rifle Division with attached armor units broke through the main defensive line. Suma fortified area was completely destroyed. At the end of February, Jack Hayes' work as an ambulance driver came to a sudden end. The next day, he was evacuated from the front line. By the end of February, Finnish defenders had been pushed back to a line in front of the strategic city of Viborg, headquarters for Finnish forces on the Karelian Isthmus. 
Finnish defenders struggled to hold their position. On the 5th of March, Soviet troops attempted a flanking maneuver across the frozen Gulf of Finland to surround Viborg. When the Finns detected columns of tanks and infantry on the ice, they fired their huge coastal batteries, 12-inch guns, intended to sink battleships. The weight and velocity of the projectiles was so enormous that it shattered the Gulf ice and opened up yawning gaps and whole Russian companies disappeared through these holes in the ice. The Finns' desperate resistance continued with a ferocity that masked their steadily diminishing capacity. By the 12th of March, they had almost no more ammunition. At noon the following day, word spread along the line. An armistice had been signed. The brutal 105-day war was over. If a fly had been in the air, he would have heard its buzz. Not a single shot. Dead silence. I did not believe such a thing was possible. Then, people started to regain their senses, started throwing hats and all kinds of stuff in the air. Almost nothing remained of our battalion. Front line is front line. All I felt was indifference. What do I remember most from that war? It was the incompetence of our army. It could not even deal with a handful of things. They showed us how to fight a war. Gunnar Latio, leading a column back towards Finland's newly negotiated border, decided to stop and check on his men. Lähdin hiihtämään sitä taaksepäin ja, ja pysähdyin yhden tien vieden vähälle korkeammalle penkalle ja pistin suksen sauvat kainoloihin ja jäin kattelemaan siinä poikia, kun ja heilautin kättä varmaan heille siinä, kun partailuna meni ohitte. Ja sitten minä nukahdin. That is where his men found him, dreaming that he was in hospital. 24 hours later, he woke up in a hospital bed. Ja olen onnellinen siitä, että, että sota päättyi sillä tavalla ja sillä hetkellä, sillä me olimme kaikki niin loppuun ajettuja, kun ikinä voi olla. Our company commander told us, the war is over. After that, he met a Finnish company commander in no man's land. In the evening, everyone started campfires. Our campfires were far from the Finnish ones. Everyone was drunk and our company commander was rebuking us. Our soldiers told him, who needs this war? Do Finns need this war? No one needs it, neither us nor Finns. Everyone was singing songs. I made myself warm at the fire. That was it. The war was over. Jack Hasey was on a ship in the mid-Atlantic, returning to the United States when he learned of the ceasefire. More than six decades later, after a career in the French Foreign Legion and the CIA, Jack Hasey was presented with Finland's highest honor, the Liberty Cross. The peace terms announced were harsh. The whole of Eastern Karelia, about 12% of Finnish territory, became part of the Soviet Union. Anitukia was nursing wounded soldiers. Ja sitten me me oikein tuskanen nuori mies opiskelija voika kai oli se ja hänen oli ammu ammutoitu siis toinen jalka pois. Ja se siellä hyvin tuskaisena siitä se sanoi mulle sitä varten kun minä sen jalkani sinne kannakselle jätteen että ryssä sen sais ja musta kun säilyis meillä vapaus. Tammy Leinenen was one of the thousands of Karelians forced from their homes by war. Ukki rupesi ihan ääneen itkemään. Ja me itki ja me lähettiin sinne. Se on sata viimeinen rauhan ehdot luvettiin, jotta me karjalaiset jäähän tänne. I didn't cry when everybody else cried. I used to go into the woods and cry alone. And that I have done many times because of the loss of Karelia, the loss of home, and because of homesickness too. And that, that was the day when homesickness 
made a nest in me and it has not disappeared. Over the next few days, 422,000 Finnish Karelians refused to become Soviet citizens. They left their homes and most of their possessions and crossed the new border into Finland. Refugees everywhere, families uh, trying to cram several generations worth of precious family belongings into one wagon or one sled. We had three days to get our things from Hitola and my mother and my grandmother went to, uh, he traveled to Hitola and my mother and father met in the middle of night under a starry sky there on the yard of the home. As winter turned to spring, Finns were left with the final unpleasant responsibility. In Suomasalmi, along 20 kilometers of the Rata Road, melting snow and ice revealed the bodies of thousands of Soviet soldiers. In spring 1940, the Finnish soldiers buried these uh, dead Russian soldiers and also horses because the summer was coming on. And it was very difficult to walk around this area in 1940, in summertime, because there were a lot of flies and the smell was uh, very bad in this area. Reino Kerti was a 21-year-old soldier assigned to a burial party. Nor were they honored by Soviet leaders. Only 350 bodies were sent to the Russian side because the Russian win this war, and they said that only 350 soldiers died here and they took all those bodies with them. The rest are still buried in mass graves on the Rate Road, unidentified by the nation that sent them into battle. When Nikita Khrushchev took over as leader of the Soviet Union after Stalin's death, he began a realistic accounting of Soviet casualties. He claimed that up to a million Soviet soldiers were lost in the three months of the Winter War. Since then, some historians have disputed Khrushchev's numbers, but few have challenged his conclusions. A victory at such a cost was actually a moral defeat. Our people never knew we had suffered a moral defeat because they were never told the truth. All of us, and Stalin first and foremost, sensed in our victory a defeat by the Finns. It was a dangerous defeat because it encouraged our enemy's conviction that the Soviet Union was a colossus with feet of clay. In short, our miserable conduct of the Finnish campaign encouraged Hitler in his plans for the Blitzkrieg, his Operation Barbarossa. Stalin's perception of the threat to Leningrad turned out to be completely in the wrong direction because when the threat came, it was from the Wehrmacht divisions pushing up through Poland and the Baltic states rather than from the Finns. It's quite possible that, that had Stalin not had the lessons of the Winter War, that his army would have been even in poorer shape when, when Hitler attacked and that Hitler actually might have managed to take Moscow. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there has been a re-examination of this pivotal conflict. It was in 1988 when the Russians said that they start the uh, Winter War. And before that, they said that the Finns started the Winter War. Most Russian people don't know anything about Winter War. They have white pages on their history. Six decades later, the Soviet Union has collapsed and all the occupied Baltic nations have regained their independence. Eastern Karelia, however, and its former capital, Vyborg, remain part of Russia. I'm waiting for Karelia to be returned to us so that I could take my grandchildren there and show that this is my original home district. And it has belonged to the neighbor for some time, but now it's again ours.
And that is what I'm waiting for. The Winter War was a formidable experience that still resonates with valuable lessons. Don't rely too much on technology. Technology is, is important, and material strength is important, but skill, how you use your equipment is uh, even more important, and ultimately will. If you don't have the will to fight, um, nothing else matters. The people of Finland have shown that a united nation, small though it may be, can develop unprecedented fighting power and thus withstand the most formidable ordeals that destiny brings. By closing ranks at the moment of peril, the people of Finland earned for themselves the right to continue to live their own independent lives within the family of free peoples. Finland won. Because had Finland lost, uh, she would have been occupied by the Soviets and she would have been like Estonia, which actually gave way to Stalin's demands and was occupied. Uh, and so in this sense, Finland won, obviously. Nature has tried, but cannot conceal the old battlefields. The anti-tank traps, blasted bunkers, unexploded shells, and unburied human remains. On these old sites of conflict, a new generation of Russians and Finns meet, not to renew a war, but to remember, reliving the past, shaping the future. From the 14th of March on the History Channel, discover the unknown and the uncertain with new episodes of Decoding the Past, exploring our supernatural history. For more information on what's coming up this month, visit thehistorychannel.co.uk.